If you've been told to pull up your socks recently, then make sure it's a pair of RCR socks. Visit www.realitycheck.radio forward slash shop. Dr. Michael Bassett is a political historian with a depth of knowledge like no other. We talked earlier with Sandra Gowdy about his article, so let's get his views on the Waitangi Tribunal, Tikanga, and the goings on at Kaingora. Michael joins me now. Welcome back to The Crunch, Dr. Michael Bassett. Good to have you back. Pleasure. We're going to touch on quite a few things, but before we get going, uh, you would have seen the news about Kainga Aura and the billions of dollars in the red that they are. And I'm thinking, you know, back to the dark days of Muldoon and thinking that this previous Labour government over six years have really performed a level of economic sabotage that that is on a scale, uh, you know, obviously in today's dollars, with what... Robert Muldoon did. The, the sole exception, of course, being Robert Muldoon actually built something. Well, Robert Muldoon <laughs> was his own Minister of Finance. Yeah. And uh, he kept a slightly easier, a slightly better uh, sort of eye on the, on the budget uh, than um, uh, Grant Robertson. Uh, I mean, the 80, million, $80 billion that uh, was borrowed and then flung around the place recklessly uh extraordinary really and uh, where now um everybody's grizzling and up in arms at the thought that somehow or other we might try to live within our means um if they ran their domestic uh, budget the way they want the government to run uh, the uh, country's budget uh we'd be in a fine shape i find it astonishing that the labor party come out and you know, Christopher Hipkins made a speech on the weekend, and it's like nothing happened in the well, actually, nothing did happen in the last six years, but it's like he's expecting us to forget the excesses of that government. As you say, the you know, the the money that was flung about with gay abandon and caused huge amounts of inflation. And they're sitting there thinking that they were these wonderful stewards of the economy. But the, the, the facts are now leaking out all over the place, Kainga Aura is just the latest one, where it's apparent that there was a systemic problem in in the cabinet in that ministers weren't on top of their portfolios and keeping a track on what was going on in these government departments. Well, my own feeling is that about half of the cabinet uh, of uh, Jacinda's and uh, uh, Hipkin's uh, weren't really on top of their portfolios. And, uh, I mean, the last year saw the most extraordinary collection of uh, uh, crises from Michael Wood to uh, Kerry Allen, uh, you know, and uh, there were others as well who just sort of fell over and weren't really properly uh, in in control. Yeah, if you look at, um, at Kaingora and housing, the two ministers that were in charge of that for pretty much uh, half each of the six years, were Phil Twyford and Megan Woods, both of whom were the campaign chairs uh, for various elections for the Labour Party. And yet this massive portfolio of which they hung their hat on for their election campaign with Kiwi Build and then extending state housing is an unmitigated disaster. Well, you said it uh... I I wouldn't in any way disagree. <laughs> have you seen anything since we last chatted? I'm going to ask you each time we chat, have you seen anything to change your mind that this was the worst government in living history? No, I said as much uh, when uh, they were in office, and I still think that certainly the worst government since the war, uh, the Second World War, yeah. uh, Weakest government, too, uh, in the sense that Labour usually, certainly it did in the 70s and the 80s, have some reasonably talented people. Uh, but things went dreadful. Even under Clark, uh, Helen Clark, in the beginning of this century, you know, there were some pretty competent people in that, uh, in her mm. moment. But um, 
that competence level just sort of faded completely. And they did no work between uh, 2008 and 2017. I mean, I found that business of setting up 240 com uh, committees to work over what they should do now that they were in office, just bizarre. Yeah. Well, one of the things that they did do is uh, make some changes that have it has enabled a few Maori radicals to start to what what from where I'm looking at it from looks like essentially like a bloodless constitutional coup um, is underway in our justice system and in our universities and uh, in society in general, all hanging around this uh, fanciful idea that there was a partnership between you know, the, the head of the British Empire at the time and a disparate group of warring uh, Maori iwi. Yes, well, that's, that's certainly what it looks like. Uh, but um, the real question is whether the government, this government, since the last government didn't, has this government got the uh, intestinal fortitude to knock it on the head? I'm not sure that Christopher Luxon does have the, the stones to do that, but I'm pretty sure that Winston Peters and David Seymour and Shane Jones uh, have got the willingness to do it. It's whether or not they're allowed to do it. Yes, quite. Well, that's that's going to be the real test. And uh, it would be a great pity if the government uh, came to the end of its time and hadn't really uh, made it perfectly clear that uh, the government – the elected government was in power and had the sole right to uh, make decisions and that there was no such thing as co-government because Māori had ceded sovereignty in 1840. That's what it's really about. Yeah, it's, it's this heroic assumption that sovereignty was never ceded that s seems to have grabbed the attention of media mainly and a few Maori radicals, uh, and, and a lot of them are, are co you know, coalescing inside the Maori Party. They've got this idea that there was this co-governance um, arrangement, and by staying silent, people who oppose that are letting it happen. Hmm. Well, certainly that's what it looks like. Um, quite where and how their version of the treaty, where it's to be found and uh, what precisely it says, I'm unaware. All I do know is that uh, the only translations of uh, the treaty that I've seen of the Maori version uh, make it absolutely clear that sovereignty was ceded forever in 1840. And therefore, there is no argument for co-governance and um, what Māori have got to do is argue, and I think they can legitimately, that uh, anything that has to do with them, they should be consulted or the appropriate Māori should be consulted. The but, right kind of Māori. Well, that's a bit different <laughs> from saying that um, uh, a handful of uh, self-appointed um, Māori leaders should... Um, uh, be able to wield 17% of uh, the power uh, on behalf of uh, people who have never elected them in any way, shape or form to speak for them. I was talking to Sandra Gowdy earlier, and she was talking about an article that you wrote on, on your website, Bassett, Brash and Hyde, about a Maori push for parallel government structures. And I was in the middle of talking to her about it, and I thought, you know, I, you know, I actually should just get you on and talk. <laughs> it's good to get somebody else's perspective of what you wrote, but it's good to find out the thinking because without blowing smoke uh, up you, you're one of the, the biggest thinkers in New Zealand politics uh, that I've ever met or known. And I read your article about this Maori push for parallel government structures and most of it being done through the Waitangi Tribunal, and their, I, I, I hesitate to call it judicial activism because they're not a, ju, uh, you know, a body that's part of the judiciary, but they think they are. And that's yes. the thrust of your article, isn't it? 
Yes, it is. Karen Fox, is it Karen Fox? Is that her name? Yes. Karen Fox seems extraordinarily self-important and, uh, you know, the feeling that uh, somehow or other we're on ki some kind of mission. I think it uh, possibly goes with the MoCo and uh, she certainly has uh, uh, got a head of steam on. But, um, I mean, the last government, r rather the last national government, was actually contemplating uh, 10 years ago getting rid of the Waitangi Tribunal because the historical uh, claims were over mm. and uh, there were only a handful of claims which could be advanced, day-to-day um, -day claims, but somehow or other they've just simply uh, decided they're a court and that well, they'll be uh, whatever they're, uh, the people that come to see them, they'll uh, simply decide in their favour uh, I don't think under Karen Fox or under any of her predecessors going back into the 1990s, I don't think the Waitangi Tribunal has ever turned down a case. Yeah, they, they take the case, they mark their own homework and then deliver what they call as a judgment that have you know far-reaching implications. And perhaps the most significant one uh, in recent memory is the Maori is the uh, foreshore and seabed uh, mm -hmm. issue that was made as a claim to the Waitangi Tribunal, and then they came out and said, yes, that's what we're going to do, and then that caused a massive problem for Helen Clark. It went to the High Court. Uh, that, mm. that was uh, Sean Elias who made that uh, decision, I think, in 2003 and caused the problem that led on to the foreshore and seabed legislation. but. Um, the legislation that Clark's government pushed through was thoroughly sensible, but uh, unfortunately it was undone uh, six years later. And um, uh, so we're living with a situation now where uh, slowly but surely the quite large parts of the coastline in New Zealand seem to be being given permanently to uh, Māori. There was a John Key government that undid all that as part yeah. of part of their, you know, bribe, I guess, to the Maori Party to garner their support, and it leads a, a lot of people to question whether or not National uh, will sell out to Maori interests at the drop of a hat when it suits them. Well, that's you. I have the same suspicion. <laughs> I'm not at all confident that Christopher Luxon wouldn't do the same thing. Well, he, he, I mean, the interesting thing that I touched on in that article that you were referring to, he seemed to be unaware of what the status of the Waitangi Tribunal really was. And when he got, uh, he, he censured a couple of his ministers for um, criticising the judiciary, he didn't, when they criticised the Waitangi Tribunal, he didn't seem to know that uh, the Waitangi Tribunal was not part of the judiciary. But what's stupid about that from Luxon's point of view is he was reacting to a farcical presumption by Thomas Coughlin that this was the judiciary and that they breached the cabinet manual, which is a joke. It's just not possible. Well, that's right. Thomas Coughlin, of course, is a pretty good journalist, hmm. far better than most of his colleagues. But uh, be that as it may, uh, he did get that one wrong. Yeah, and then that led to Luxon trying to tell off David Seymour and Winston Peters, who both probably laughed at him quietly in the <laughs> background. <laughs> but uh, you know, you mentioned in this in this article that it appears to be an attempt. Not, I mean, it's it's like a there's a, a slow moving strategy. The first tactic is would seem to be to try and get themselves declared as a court. And so they need to create an issue for them to then be able to progress that. Um, and that issue was, let's see if we can get a minister summoned to the tribunal to answer questions or be harangued or whatever they, they plan to do over government policy that a government was elected to enact. And they were trying to insert themselves into the political debate. Uh, then that, of course, went to the High Court, and then we've got this judgment that's saying, well, yes, 
the, the High Court agreed and said, no, you can't uh, summons a minister. And then it went to the Court of Appeal, and then we got this outrageous decision that basically um, achieved what the Waitangi Tribunal was trying to achieve, which was to get themselves lifted above quasi-judicial to actually being part of the judiciary. Well, we have a very serious problem developing with our judiciary, the upper echelons of it. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure whether it is it was sloppy appointments uh, by both National and Labor. I suspect it was both parties that have been responsible for putting people who were not fit and proper onto the uh, um, court. Um, but um, uh, we're dealing with uh, people who, it seems to me, have divorced themselves from common sense. Well, it certainly appears to, that way. I mean, if you just look at the legislation that created the Waitangi Tribunal, there's no way it's a court. And yet we're seeing increasingly judges that are writing law from the bench. And yes. that always ends in disaster. Yes. And they're very, very prone to uh, accept any Māori sob story. Now, I've spent much of my life arguing that Māori have a need to deserve a fair shake of the dice. But uh, I went to a function uh, not that long ago where the Chief Justice uh, was to speak and she spoke for about 20 minutes in Māori. And there was nobody uh, there uh, from, um, uh, no Māori present as far as I could see. And uh, quite why it was necessary, I do not know. Uh, it, it was discourteous, if nothing else. Well, you're seeing this at all levels of the court system, because if you go and, you know, and I've spent a fair bit of time in court, um, unfortunately, but uh, you know, ten years ago, um, you would attend court. The registrar would come through the door and say, you know, ask everybody to stand. While his honour came in, he would stand up the front, nod to the you know all the people there, sit down, and then the various lawyers would stand up and introduce themselves. And then you know they might say, "I'm Smith for the defence," or uh, "Jones for the, for the prosecution." And, and then the, the judges acknowledge them and just make a note and then sit down and say, right, well, let's get going and, and start the process. It took about five minutes to do that. Now, however, uh, particularly if there's any Crown solicitors involved or um, barristers representing aspects of the Crown or a Crown entity of some sort, you get these pepihas now where... The judge comes in, there's a, a about a 20-second or 30-second ramble in Maori, God knows what it says. Uh, the judge comes in, nods to everybody, sits down, and then they proceed to stand up and recite who all their ancestors were for five or ten minutes each. Is this in court? In court, yeah. I couldn't believe it when I saw it. It's changed just in ten years. Bizarre. So... Yeah, you know, well, actually, it's probably just changed uh, you know, since we had a Labor government. But the government departments are the ones that are pushing all of this. And it is making justice confusing because not everybody speaks Maori and not everybody is going to, no. ever. Right. And, and yet they're pushing this on everybody and sort of sniggering to themselves uh, that you can't understand it, and perhaps you you know you should, you should educate yourself, and that's the arrogance of it all. Yeah, so it's, it's exceedingly arrogant stuff, and that is one of the reasons why I think the opposition to Maori and Maori programs and Maori claims uh, is so hostile, and will get more hostile. It is the extraordinary arrogance of a lot of it. And again, I think this comes back to the previous government, you know, led by Labour uh, and Labour in its entirety for the last three years, who promulgated this fanciful idea there was this co-governance. Uh, you know, National stupidly, John Key stupidly signed uh, the UNDRIP, which basically agreed to that sort of Indigenous rights. And and. I spoke to John Key about that, and I said, why did you sign UNDRIP? He says, oh, well, you know, because there's no Indigenous people in New Zealand. And I said, you fool, there are now. <laughs> <laughs> right? 
Yeah. Uh, you know, and that's what Winston said. You know, that caused great consternation in the chattering classes when he said there's no Indigenous people from New Zealand. Uh, mm. Everyone, it, their own uh, whakapapa says that they came from somewhere else in canoes. And yet mm. we've now got this idea that they were going to Indigenous peoples and then that goes into the co-governance arrangements of the Treaty of Waitangi, which were never in there. And as you point out in the article, you know, a, a proper translation, a, a realistic translation, it said the chiefs of the Confederation give absolutely to the Queen of England forever the complete government over their land. Quite. Full stop. That's it. There's yes. no equivocating. There's no weasel words in there. There's no get out of jail clauses. There's none of that. And the funny thing is, while that interpretation, which uh, uh, was done by Sir Hugh Carfrew, replaced the original text, and even the text of the treaty in English, and I've got it here in front of me, uh, says that the Confederation of the United Tribes of New Zealand cede to Her Majesty the Queen of England absolutely and without reservation all the rights and powers of sovereignty. So uh, there was no great surprise in Hugh Carfrew's uh, translation. Where my point is that this doubt that you will find in various places about whether Maori ceded sovereignty is never backed up by any actual new translation of the treaty. Uh, they don't dare do that. They like to keep a degree of confusion because it suits Māori to reinterpret the treaty. It suits them to reinterpret all sorts of things. Tikanga is made up on the hoof. Uh, and um, so it's one of the reasons why Māori is so opposed to David Seymour's idea of uh, the treaty principles because he would have something that was fixed and made clear in law. They want a fluid situation where they can reinterpret whenever they like and uh, the rest of us can um, fall into line. And uh, it's all being done by a handful, a relative handful of people who are claiming that they're acting on behalf of oppressed Māori, most of the so-called oppressed Māori wouldn't know who these guys were, or guyesses, uh, and, um, you know, they uh, it's, it's all bullswool. And you're right, they never say uh, where they've got this idea from. If you then, then point to uh, a translation or the English version, then they say, oh, no, that's not what it means. It means something different now. Yes, that's right. Well, they want confusion because uh, they know that New Zealanders don't want to be labelled racist and they don't want to be called out. But the reality is that most New Zealanders have reached the point where they've had a guts full of this stuff. And uh, I suspect that uh, if um, it really came to a vote, uh, Māori would have great difficulty uh, getting very far. The immigration coming into the country is incredibly sour about the preponderance of effort that's being put into Māori. Um, you've only got to look at the Auckland results in the election last year to see that. Mm. Uh, the Indians and the joined the Chinese who joined, um, you know, many of the other uh, uh, ethnic groups who just saying you can't give a preponderance of say on matters of government to people, a small number of people, on the grounds of some kind of bogus, and it is increasingly bogus ethnicity. I mean, you're looking at people who are uh, one-eighth, one sixteenth, one thirty second, Maori, and claiming that that drop gives them a jump ahead of the new citizens, the white citizens, uh, everybody else. Well, you're seeing people, you know, in the media 
like Phil Gifford, for example, who, who should just stick to commenting on sport because uh, he knows a little bit about that. Not a great deal, but, but enough to get by um, and make a crust doing that who proclaim uh, that they've now discovered their Maoriness that was hidden from them uh, in the past, and uh, they're now what I like to call neo-Maoris. They've discovered this little minute piece of DNA, and somehow that minute piece of DNA is so powerful that they're entirely Maori now. And, and a case in point would be Willie Jackson who has a very tiny percentage of, of Maori ancestry DNA and actually, in fact, has more Jewish uh, DNA than he does have Maori DNA, but yet he's the right sort of Maori and uh, is, in effect, probably one of the most vocal racists that there are in New Zealand politics today. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm inclined to agree. Mm. But, but again, we come back to the treaty, and, and I mean, you've noted that there's this, uh, and, this, and I have to lay the blame of this at the feet of the media, where it's now probably impossible to er eradicate this phony debate about what the treaty says and what it was intended to do. And as I said, I blame the media for that because they have not been critical. They have not said, hang on a second, but what about this? Uh, or at any stage of it, they have embraced what Bob Jones calls Maori wonderfulness mm -hmm. and have now turned their news organisations into organisations that have uh, produced news stories that are filled with almost pidgin English now, mm -hmm. uh, words being inserted uh, for, that, you know, for, for calling New Zealand uh, you know, a different name or all sorts of other things that go into it. One of the um, interesting things was that the new government said that it wanted uh, organisations to be called by their English names. Sure, they could have their Māori name tagged on, but um, Radio New Zealand has uh, slipped, uh, TV1 has slipped, TV3 has slipped, um, they're all going back. The Herald, of course, never uh, uh, got off the marification bandwagon. And um, you, you're looking at a situation where they are thumbing their nose, all of them at the government. Well, you've got the situation where the previous government, again, I blame them for this, went about changing everything. We, we used to have the Ministry of Health, and then that was split into two. And both of the organisations were given Maori names. You know, we had to, what was it, to Fato Aura and something else. And all of a sudden, it was like this assumption that if you give something a Maori name, it'll be better. <laughs> and, and we've seen from Kaying Aura that that's not the case. You know, it's like them uh, launching the supposedly fast rail solution between Hamilton and Auckland and calling it, uh, uh, naming it after a dead bird, thinking that that was going to make it fly. <laughs> and and it hasn't. It's highly subsidised. We've got a situation where ninety seven percent of the costs of that uh, rail service are met by the state in various guises, either the local council or or actually the state. And only three percent of the expenses of of this massive boondoggle, so they could say they had train services between Hamilton and Auckland, is met. Is only three percent is met by the paying customers, of which there are a scant few. Right. It, but but they could, they gave it a Maori name, so it'll be better, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, Maori names. There's there's something in the Herald this morning, an article which where a sentence begins with uh, a couple of Maori words, and there's nothing to indicate what on earth they refer to, uh, what it is that's being said. Um, uh, we're we're sort of we've lost our way uh, somehow, and um, uh, it's insulting really to Māori to have inflicted upon them the silliness uh, which um, patronising Pākehā are um, inflicting on them. I think it's mainly from the left-type parties, Labour Party, Green Party, Māori Party. There's this patronising idea that Māori are helpless 
mm. that they can't do things for themselves, uh, and therefore the state needs to step in and mollycoddle them at every level of society uh, for everything they do, a separate health system, a separate education system, separate, 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 everything separate, and that will give better outcomes. And there's no evidence for that, that that will ever work. And there's plenty of evidence to suggest that the apartheidation of New Zealand society won't work. Right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 I know what you mean. Yeah. Well, yes. Uh, well, you know, uh, co-governance and separate development, if you know anything about the rest of the world where those sorts of policies have been tried, you know to avoid them. And the notion that somehow or other Māori can have all of their things and uh, a bogus tikanga and uh, a bogus this and that, um, and um, that we can all get on sweetly together while the rest of us uh, kowtow to them, forget it. This country is capable of descending into ethnic warfare if uh, there isn't a, an improvement. Well, this tikanga thing is is all driven by the same premise, isn't it? Yep. That our time-honoured uh, judicial system, court system, legal system will be improved by adding tikanga but, uh, into the system and Nobody that, can define what what they really mean by tikanga. But who's tikanga? Is it well, is it, it Napui's tikanga, or is it uh, it is every iwi has its own tikanga? Two foreigners or wherever. Wherever <laughs> Who, who's tikanga, and and who says that this is going to make it better? It's not that, law. That's the key question. People overlook the fact that, you know, there were only at the time of the treaty 100,000 Māori in mm. New Zealand in a country that now has well over 5 million. And, you know, they were scattered around in little groups, little linkage between them, except when uh, a, a, a raiding party, a warlike uh, party, uh, set off to uh, subject or subjugate them or to eat them. Uh, and there was a fair amount of that during the musket wars. Um, I mean, the thought that each individual tribe had its own customs didn't seem to occur uh, to people today who uh, talk as though somehow or other there was some pan Maori tikanga, which there never was and never will be. Well, it, it just can't. Uh, you, can't you, know, get, you can't get them to agree. I mean, government starting with, uh, I think it was Holyoaks in the 60s, tried to get a group that would speak for Maori as a whole. That was the origin of the Māori Council, and it never really worked. And uh, in the end, you don't hear anything from the Māori Council today. I don't know whether it even exists anymore. Uh, but um, uh, you do hear occasionally from the Iwi Leaders Federation, is it, or the Iwi Chiefs Federation? I can't recall. Something like that. Some precise, some precise name. But even it can't, it's incapable of actually binding all the iwi that it uh, claims uh, are gathered under it. Um, and so the consequence is that um, there is no standard thing called tikanga and no uh, standard uh, customs or practices or anything, really. Uh, yeah. And and if if you look, you know, you mentioned the musket wars in eighteen twenty one. Hongi Hika raided extensively against his rivals. This is just nineteen years before the treaty was signed. He raided extensively uh, in the Auckland and Coromandel region mm. and captured in excess of two thousand slaves and marched them back to to Nap Napui lands. And you know, nineteen years later, uh, I mean, he he died in eighteen twenty eight, but 
1840, we're signing a treaty with the Crown. And the Crown in the UK at that time had abolished slavery, but the treaty allowed the various chiefs to keep all of their possessions, which included slaves. Mm. And we have to have this heroic assumption that Maori were this erudite, enlightened, wonderful group of people that were stunning navigators, but somehow couldn't boil water or make any implements with metal, uh, were on an equal footing with a, a woman who would go on to be the Empress of India and the head of the British Empire. Mm. It's a fantasy, but we're, we're supposed to not say anything about it, to nod sagely and agree that there was this partnership or code governance unwritten in the treaty, but that was the intention of Captain Hobson and, and the British. Mm. I'm struggling with this. <laughs> ah, well, I think uh, if you've got any questions, uh, by all means, uh, fling them and uh, <laughs> I'll, uh, and or we'll call it a day. <laughs> That's the thing. Is there a way out of this? Is there a way, a solution to this activism from the Waitangi Tribunal and the imposition of tikanga uh, and this uh, this belief that there was a co-governance arrangement, unwritten, unsaid, but it's there nonetheless. Is there a way out of this? Well, governments have to be quite frank with uh, uh, this tiny number of people, and they are small. It is a small number who keep arguing this way all the time. Your great mass of uh, Maori workers and truck drivers and uh, uh, nurses and so on don't believe any of this bull's wool, uh, and or at least don't care about it. Mm. But um, uh, governments have to be firm and make it crystal clear that sovereignty was ceded in 1840, that all the governments since then have been legitimate governments, that uh, Māori uh, are entitled to their own political parties if they want them. But uh, uh, remember that uh, you've got to uh, abide by the rules that have been set by all. Yeah, yeah. nearly nearly 200 years of of uh, jurisprudence and, and lawmaking by yeah. legitimate parliaments that have represented in everybody's interests. Quite. But until such time as governments are quite firm on those things, make it clear to uh, Māori that they uh, can advance their arguments in probably, preferably, a pan-Māori body that should be elected by all Māori to speak for Māori to government instead of just having a few um, self-appointed experts, uh, moko ladies from the University of Waikato or um, uh, the Waitangi Tribunal or wherever. Uh, Margaret, Margaret Mutu, who I see has changed her name now to something else. Mutu. Yes, well, I mean, she's a disaster, poor soul. But um, she, they, the media go to her every single oh, time, though, don't they? She can, you can count on her to say something that will give them a cheap and easy headline. Yeah, and uh, away it away it continues to go. But I, there may be some people around who agree with Margaret Muto. I confess I've never come across any. <laughs> and you've been around a long time to meet a lot of people. So. Oh, yes. oh, she came along to the Waitangi Tribunal, I remember, on one occasion and uh, sat in the back grumbling and uh, uh, saying that it was a disgrace that I could even ask certain key questions that were uh, relevant to the case. Um, uh, you've got a real strange one there. But she's the go-to person to the media. So that's where we come back to, isn't it? Isn't the problem that we've got in New Zealand society is a lack of responsible journalism and a lack of responsible editors and a lack of journalistic credulity about what all of these people that are pushing these agendas, no one's holding them to account and they seem to be actually cheerleading and bandwagoning rather than actually doing their job. That is true, but you have to go a step further. Uh, there is a real problem with the universities in this country now. Mm. Uh, they are in serious decline, 
and uh, um, history and uh, politics and so on. Um, you know, there are very, very few really good, reliable academics left to uh, straighten out the journalists, to educate them in the first place. And um, sad to say, this country at present is going through a, quite a decline. Mm -hmm. it, I find it quite distressing, really. Uh, but um, the best brains are departing. And uh, the um, uh, some of the worst are um, in the media. Yeah. Well, I don't know if we can, you and I can solve the problems of the world, but maybe we should. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. The politicians need to grasp the nettle. They need to not be afraid of upsetting a few rowdy people and and start to make decisions around these sorts of things. As you pointed out, there's very few claims. In fact, I think there's only one major claim outstanding, which is Napui. The Thanks. day of the Waitangi Tribunal is, is over. Really. Oh, long, long gone. Mm. It's all, I mean, Margaret Mutu, we were talking about, uh, she's at the centre of uh, quite a lot of the trouble up there. Uh, and, uh, I mean, it's it's a problem solving it, uh, Napui being a big variegated uh, area with uh, uh, a lot of people living and working outside of the area mm. uh, and um, putting their awe in from time to time and uh, making it very difficult to, for uh, the government to actually find a satisfactory solution. And every day that goes by while these people have their way and stop a solution is a day when Napui fails to get the settlement uh, resources, which uh, they um, eventually will. You know, I can remember uh, a news article that showed Andrew Little, the treaty negotiations minister at the time, with a very angry look on his face. It just, you know, he had the nickname Angry Andrew for a reason, or Angry Andy for a reason. He was an angry man, but he was at a, a meeting to try and progress the Napui claim. And he got so frustrated, he was banging the table and, and somebody took a photo of it. And I actually felt sorry for Andrew Little at that point. And it's not often I have uh, too much uh, compassion for politicians. They, they enter the fray willingly. Um, but in this instance, I actually felt sorry for him that here he was trying to actually progress something yep. and was met with intransigence that you could not could not believe unless you were part of it. And well, I actually felt sorry for him. Chris Finlayson had had the same problem before that. I mean, he tried hard to get a settlement. Uh, and he'd be the softest treaty negotiation person ever, Chris Finlayson. You know, yeah. he's, a, he, he's, a, he's a lock for Maori interests, Chris Finlayson, that's for sure. You know, And if he got frustrated by it, then it just shows you just how bad, badly managed or badly controlled Napui and the various hapu in, uh, that, are, that are part of Napui are letting the, the entire iwi down. But Napui is a sort of a microcosm mm. of the wider problem of Māori in New Zealand. They're yeah. all, nobody agrees with anybody else. They're all, uh, you know, um, singing their own songs and uh, got their own version of tikanga. And um, uh, Māori are a very difficult people when it comes to dealing with them politically. Uh, I mean, it, I'll bet you've got lots of Maori friends. I have. Yeah. Uh, uh, you get on with them, and they're they're wonderful. Yeah. But uh, how have they got such jerks representing them? Well, I mean, you know, we talked about the Waitangi Tribunal trying to elevate themselves to a judiciary, and you've mentioned that the. Be, it would be good to have a pan Maori organization that could represent Maori, perhaps be elected. But we've seen a similar tactic, haven't we, in 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 Tainui, trying to extend the Kingitanga movement to be a pan Maori movement, which of course will never work because Napui not going to listen to someone from Tainui. Neither is Tufari Toa, neither is uh, 
uh, you know, Nadi Kahanunu or or <laughs> anybody else. The, the, the Tini Tanga movement is isolated to two areas of New Zealand, and the rest of Maoridom looks at them and goes, what are you, trying to be a white person, you know? Yeah. A quasi king movement that was dreamed up because they thought it was a good idea if the if England could have a queen, then we can have a king too. Mm. And people forget that. Yes. I think we've uh, about... Um, yes, I think so. ...sourced to our issues, uh, but um, we'll talk again sometime. Well, thank you very much for coming on uh, again, Michael, and it's been a real pleasure. I always enjoy talking to Michael Bassett about politics. He's forgotten more than I remember about politics. And he's also such a gentleman, but he does have strong opinions on the excesses of a few Maori radicals who seem to have hijacked the Waitangi Tribunal. Let me know your thoughts by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to or dislike what you're listening to, either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you, so connect with us today.